Here we go. All righty, so good morning or good afternoon, wherever you might be in the United States, wherever you're tuning in from, welcome, welcome to our Ask the Expert series. Um, our Ask the Expert series today will be LGBTQ plus caregiving program in collaboration with the Alzheimer's Association and also SAGE. Uh, my name is June Her. I'm the program manager from the uh, Alzheimer's Association New York State chapter where I do help deliver different education programs such as today's and also connect caregivers with you know, Alzheimer's information and resources. Um, so I do wanna take a quick time to locate the chat box, right? Where you can answer questions that you might have that's gonna be answered at the end of the presentation, right? So just to help others locate the chat, you know, let me know in the chat where you're tuning in from because I do wanna know. So take a quick moment. Let me know where, where you're tuning in from. New York, New Jersey, California, Texas, um, Alaska. <laughs> Let me know. Let me know. That way it also helps for others to locate the chat box. Awesome. Great, great, great. Thank you. Lots of New York. We see some Florida up in here. Absolutely. South Carolina, Indiana. Thank you. Absolutely. So now you've probably seen the chat box. So That's where the chat box will be. Uh, as a reminder, today's program will be recorded and the recording will be sent out through email once it's uploaded onto our New York City Chapters YouTube channel. Uh, so be on the lookout for that, hopefully within the following weeks. Uh, and we will be following up with any resource that we might have. All right. So now I'm going to hand it over to one of our New York City community educators who's going to introduce themselves for a quick awareness presentation before we hear from Liz Kimports, our guest speaker from Sage. So take it away, Melton, while I share my screen. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Melton and I am one of the community educators for the Alzheimer's Association. And uh, I not only uh, engage with the Alzheimer's Association and, and one of my reasons for getting engaged was really, I also lived with it, not myself personally, but as a caregiver with my mom. And I saw uh, the progress of the, of the disease and how it affects people uh, that is impacted and also the, the, the caregivers and the community around them. And there are a few things I'd like you to know about today's presentation. If there are two things you can take away, one of them is definitely this is a disease that affects many, many people more than we are realizing most of the time, more than, more than we think about. And then the second part is no one should have to go through this alone. So that's very important. There are resources. Asking for help and getting yourself a support system is very important, whether you're a caregiver or, uh, uh, or going through the experience as a patient yourself. So I would like to start with that. And um, once we go through the presentation, we'll certainly have questions. So I'd like to take them at the end, if that's all right. And we'll get through some statistics first so we can get started with that. Uh, going back to my point about how many people this affects. So the 2024 Alzheimer's disease facts and figures, you can find a lot of these on our website, on the ALZ uh, website as well. And as I mentioned, I'm a volunteer for, for the Alzheimer's Association. And over 11 million America, Americans provide unpaired care for people with uh, Alzheimer's or other kinds of dementia. So dementia is an umbrella term we're going to be hearing quite a bit uh, today. And nearly 7 million people are living with Alzheimer's today. And uh, while the heart disease has been decreasing, Alzheimer's related deaths have been increasing, as you can see from the, uh, from the page here. And this is costing not only an emotional and spiritual burden, but there's also a financial burden to our community. So the cost of these, the care will be increasing over the next several years. And uh, three in one seniors die with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia. And it kills more than breast, uh, breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. So 
these are some of the facts that I want you to be aware of because sometimes we don't think of it as such an impactful disease and it's part of aging and all of that, but it is quite impactful emotionally, spiritually, physically, and also financially. And the lifetime risk for Alzheimer's at age 45 is one in five for women and one in 10 for men. And we'll talk about how it affects different types of communities as well as part of the presentation. So as we move forward, uh, I'd like to start with a definition of dementia that's always used interchangeably for us to all have a common vocabulary. Dementia is the umbrella term for loss of memory and other thinking abilities severe enough to interfere with daily life. And some of you perhaps experiencing with your parents or or one of all of us might experience it ourselves because it's part of the, the aging process, but there are different types of dementia as well, Alzheimer's being the most prominent one. But there is other types, vascular dementia, dementia caused by Lewy body, frontotemporal, other like uh, Huntington's and mixed dementia, you can have combination or different types of dementia as well. So these are important to identify. We have other presentations that go into the differences and everything, but it's important to understand the term dementia versus Alzheimer's. And uh, what is Alzheimer's? It's a brain, brain, we basically mentioned that it's a brain disease that causes problems with memory, thinking and behavior. And the symptoms increasingly grow and become severe enough to interfere with daily tasks. And it's a progressive disease where symptoms uh, worsen over a number of years, but it can also accelerate and become sooner. In early stages, memory loss is mild, but as it progresses, individuals will need a lot of around the clock care and the disease is ultimately fatal. And that care process is again, uh, quite taxing, uh, not only financially, but emotionally and uh, spiritually for the caregivers as well, the people around the patient as well. And when we look at the LGBTQ community uh, and the Alzheimer's disease, uh, we find some interesting statistics. LGBTQ older adults living with dementia are significantly more likely to live alone. And hence my point about no one should have to go through this alone, right? And this is very important that there are resources we'll talk about. And 40% of them report that their support networks have become smaller over, over time. 34% of them live alone. Up to 30% experience lower rates of access to care. And that is really uh, one of the issues that we should try to address. And fear of discrimination can delay access to care as well, which is a, an important number, 40% saying their healthcare providers don't know their sexual orientation. So these, these are some of the more specific statistics for the community here. And when we talk about the caregiving, I can certainly attest from my uh, personal experience, caregivers are more likely to be caring in isolation and uh, it is very stressful. It, it leads to caregiver burnout. Uh, resources, uh, although I didn't go through this in the US, US I think with Alzheimer's Association is increasingly becoming uh, even uh, internationally a very important resource for us to understand what are the options available and what the disease does or care options. And 40% of the caregivers report support networks have become smaller over time, two times as likely to live alone these groups, three to four times less likely to have children and health laws and definition of family complicate the care caregiving arrangements as well, uh, as some of you might be familiar. And uh, when we look at the broader populations, we have black Americans are about twice as likely as white Americans to have Alzheimer's or other dementia. Hispanic Americans are one and a half times as likely to have disease as white Americans. Almost two thirds of Americans uh, are living the living with Alzheimer's are women. So these are, again, some stri striking statistics that give you an idea of the impact on different communities uh, for this disease. 
And I just actually myself came from a yoga class in Bryan Park, New York City today. And it was wonderful weather. We are not having much, feet, uh, much heat, which is great to do some exercising out there. And as June always says, you know, a healthy brain, whatever is good, your, good, your, good for your heart goes for your brain as well. I think we have to think about Alzheimer's just like we think about the rest of our health. We go jogging, we do exercising, we take the stairs sometimes to keep healthy, to keep our, our muscles in shape. But what are we doing about brain health? And for cognitive decline, uh, it's very important that we there are certain things we can control and to be aware of that for brain health. Increasing key healthy habits may lower the risk of cognitive decline and possibly dementia. And overall, what's good for your heart is good for your brain. Uh, exercise, healthy nutrition are some of the things that we all talk about, but it's important to keep a focus on brain health individually as well. And it's never too late. Uh, if you haven't done exercise, if you had bad habits, it's never too late to make some changes. And it's never too early to start making healthy choices for your brain health as well. And this is preparing, lowering risk factors for dementia and Alzheimer's. And here is, I guess, in terms of this, my second point, nobody should have to go through this alone. It affects a lot more people than we realize, but there are resources. And I'm pleased to say, you know, volunteering with the Alzheimer Association, I've come across a lot of the resources they provide, 24 seven helpline that you can call and get uh, master's level clinicians and specialists helping you in over 200 languages. Uh, online community, I think building a community, getting help that way with people that are going through this experience with others is very important. I didn't do this. Please do this yourself. It's very important part of that and how you go through this experience. A comprehensive database of local dementia and aging related, related resources in our website and resource finder. It's quite extensive and rich. And the website, as I mentioned, alz.org that has a number of uh, different uh, uh, sections that will be of uh, support for you. We, uh, the association uh, uh, provides education and support for caregivers and individuals living with Alzheimer's or other dementia. And it could be in, in person or virtually and online. There are a lot of programs online as you're seeing one of these. And, and I think locally as well, I do encourage you to connect share your experiences with others, and that is the local chapters nationwide that you can connect with. That's in the lower right-hand side box that will be uh, in the Find Us section of the website. So um, there are a lot of resources. I encourage you to start with the website and then go from there as to what you need, and we can certainly answer some questions about that as well today. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Liz, uh, Liz Kim Ports, uh, who is going to continue with the rest of the organization, every rest of the presentation, but we are here absolutely to answer questions, which we'll take at the end. Liz? Hello, I'm going to share my screen um, and would love to know um, if this is nice and visible for folks. All right, great. Um, so my name is Liz Kinfords. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm a care manager at SAGE. I co-facilitate our uh, dementia caregiver support group um, and also work more broadly with our caregivers um, who have whose loved ones have all, all kinds of different concerns, but um, Alzheimer's and dementia are things that I see a lot all the time. Um, and it is June, it is Pride Month. I'm very, very grateful to be here uh, this month in particular to sort of, um, to facilitate this and to reflect on the um, impact that our career elders have had on um, on us today. And, and how wonderful um, it is to be able to work in a space that really honors them and to you know continue to facilitate this work. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to do that. Um, so um, the, as, as, was, as Meltem touched on really eloquently, the LGBTQ caregiving experience um, 
I'm going to back up and define LGBTQ just in case there are folks um, who don't know what that stands for. It's um, an acronym that I know uh, comes in many different forms. You might see LGBT, you might see a longer one. Um, LGBTQ+, plus. we at SAGE utilize that one because um, we feel the plus encompasses uh, a number of different identities and expressions, um, but L G, B, and T stands for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. The Q stands for queer, which is a term that has been reclaimed by the community um, in more recent years. But there are a lot of um, LGBTQ folks who don't identify with that term. Um, first and foremost, when you are you know, working with someone in the community, using the language that they use to identify themselves is is paramount. Um, so if someone is a, you know, a woman who's in a relationship with a woman and they describe themselves as gay rather than lesbian, that's language that you can reflect. Um, and the plus also encompasses uh, folks who are asexual, folks who are non-binary, um, questioning, intersex. There are so many um, different identities and every person has a very unique experience. Um, so as with everyone, you know, that we're working with, um, it's important to sort of just listen to how they self-define, de self-describe, um, and, you know, the ways in which their identity manifests and what that looks like. Um, so the LGBTQ plus experience in caregiving often looks very different. Um, the program that I work under in New York City is a statewide program that encompasses, um, that provides funding to different organizations um, for caregivers, sort of in, in a vast number of situations. And a lot of them are grandparents who are caring for grandchildren. Um, SAGE doesn't have any of those. Um, we have a lot of caregivers who are neighbors, um, who are friends, a lot of partners, but also, um, you know, someone who lives down the hall and is worried for, for somebody, um, and they count as a caregiver as well. Um, family structure looks very different. There's a lot of emphasis in our community on chosen family, um, the loved ones that, you know, you, that our clients have, have grown up around um, are not necessarily as present in our community. Um, so that's, that's something that ends up time and time again, being incredibly important for our folks. Um, what considerations can providers make to support LGBTQ caregivers? Um, I think there's not one simple answer to this. I would love to, um, once we get to the Q&A section at the end, hear some individual experiences, individual questions, but it looks so different, again, just as it looks different for every person that comes through the doors of any agency, but it looks so different from person to person here. Um, <clears throat> And what that can mean for one individual um, is, is not at all what it means for everyone, but sort of listening to what that family structure looks like, resourcing in different ways, um, resourcing in ways that incorporate friends, incorporate neighbors more than they, you know, might necessarily incorporate um, biological family, uh, and also when we are making referrals, we are very considerate to make referrals to organizations that are LGBT affirming, because that is something um, that Meltem also uh, touched upon. Um, there are a great deal of my clients who have essentially, you know, lived out for 50, 60 years and have gone into assisted living or encountered a new provider and have gone back into the closet for the first time maybe in in many many years because they fear that the treatment that they will receive is not the same as the treatment others will receive um and i wish i could say that that's an unfounded fear but it's not um so 
ensuring that we have um, a good idea of who the providers are, who are affirming, who are accepting, um, whether that's medical, whether that's uh, mental health support, whether that is just case management organizations is one of the things that we consider very vital. Um, we do have a, a sort of directory within the organization of, of agencies that we tend to refer to. Um, and we also have a program um, called Sage Care that uh, implements LGBTQ trainings for agencies, um, which has been such an instrumental part of Sage and such a big part of the framework of our organization and what our goals are. Um, unfortunately, you know, it is only agencies that reach out to us and ask for the training that we are able to train. So um, that's not every org in the city, that's not every org in the country, but it is a nationwide program. Um, so there are around 3 million older adults over the age of 50 who identify as LGBTQ+. Um, by 2030, it's expected to grow to about 7 million. Um, when we are looking at the older adult population of the LGBTQ community, the AIDS crisis had a huge impact here. Um, the number of LGBTQ older adults, especially men, is significantly less than, frankly, it should be today because of um, because of AIDS, because so many people were lost. Um, and we see that every single day with our clients. Um, we have programming for um, long-term survivors of HIV who are living with HIV for 20, 30 plus years. But every single one of my clients has some story about a community member, a loved one, a friend, a family member that they lost um, to HIV and AIDS. Um, and that is also a sort of historical and fundamental trauma of the LGBTQ community. Um, I think especially when you're taking into consideration work in major cities, which is my area of expertise, I, I work in New York. Um, but that trauma was, was sort of reawakened, especially for our older adults during COVID. Um, we saw another pandemic coming in that um, once again, our constituency was in the highest risk group for this time, not because of their um, identity, but because they are older adults. Um, we saw how deeply, deeply, deeply older adults were impacted by COVID. Um, and there's a lot of residual trauma. There's a lot that came up through that. Um, and there's a lot that folks, um, I think, remains unaddressed broadly countrywide um, about um, the, the two pandemics, AIDS and COVID. Um, census data still does not collect information about LGBTQ plus identities, um, which is a disparity that um, is pretty notable in 2024. Um, but there are, you know, other um, other polls, other nationwide um, data gathering that does, um, thankfully, but the US census still does not collect that information. Um, Meltem, I know that you went over some of these stats as well, but they are very important in terms of the work that I do. Um, specifically, um, LGBTQ older adults are twice as likely to be single. They're twice as likely to live alone. Um, there are a lot of folks that um, I work with who are in their, their late 80s, their 90s. I have a couple of clients who are 100 and they live by themselves. Um, and that's you know, something that is quite frankly ideal if there's the capacity for that, if they are safe at home, if they are, you know, able to access everything they need, if they're able to complete um, activities of daily life and be relatively independent, um, sorry, um, then, you know, we, we really love to see them aging in place, especially because a lot of them have been in these apartments um, and homes for decades upon decades. Um, but, you know, that's that's a big part of my job is to make sure that when they are living alone, they are safe. 
um, LGBTQ plus older adults are also four times less likely to have children. A lot of the time when we see caregiving relationships, it is adult children caring for their parents um, and sometimes grandparents. That is not commonly the case within the LGBTQ plus community. Um, there are a lot of a lot of folks within the community that do have children. Um, and um, similar to relationships with other family members, um, those relationships can be incredibly, incredibly strong and incredibly supportive. Um, and they can also be fraught. Um, LGBTQ plus older adults are more likely to face poverty and homelessness, which are massive, massive barriers to um, being connected to support and care. Housing is the most fundamental area um, in which people, the most fundamental building block on which we can sort of create um, a space of care. Um, they also have higher rates of physical and mental health challenges. This includes higher rates of um, substance use, including alcohol and uh, tobacco use. Um, it includes um, higher rates of um, mental health crises, suicidality, um, and um, obesity, and like the the health impacts that all of these things have. Um, we still again in 2024 are seeing shorter lifespans for people in the LGBTQ plus community um, because of health disparities. So as I mentioned, caregiving relationships and personal networks look different within this community. Um, chosen family, that is a term that is broadly used by the LGBTQ community. Um, and it it has just as much significance, if not more, than uh, biological family. Um, it's something that we explore all the time, you know, at intake with our with our folks. Um, the first thing we ask is, what is your support network? And a lot of the time it is community. It is um you know, spaces of faith, it is spaces of community organizing and activism, it is um, physical space, uh, neighbors, neighborhood, um, and we see that much, much more often than we see, um, you know, parents, children, brothers, sisters. Um, and again, I touched on this previously, but LGBTQ plus older adults may have less trust and faith in formal supports. Um, this is a community that, quite frankly, has been let down by legislators time and time again, especially over the lifespan history of an older adult. Um, they have been let down by the medical community, by the mental health community, um, and there is a lot of residual trauma there. Um, and especially as dementia is coming up, um, these sort of past experiences of homophobia and discrimination may come up over and over again. Um, and that is something that we need to be cognizant of as providers, that we need to be cognizant of as caregivers, as loved ones, um, is that having, you know, these negative sort of lifetime experiences. When you look back over uh, the last 20 years and what just, just legislation around LGBTQ plus rights has looked like, um, there is so much disparity um, between, uh, you know, what things looked like when people were reaching adulthood and now that they are considered our older adults. Um, so that is something very important um, that we are also, you know, and SAGE has a big advocacy arm that is trying to do a lot of work towards um, making the world better for LGBTQ older adults. But I do think we still have a long way to go. And I think that there are areas in which um, today things look fairly scary for this community. Um, and that's often difficult to to sit with. Um, so now I have uh, all the time for questions. Um, I guess I'll, I'll 
share it back. Um, but I would love to hear um, what folks' experience has been um, either working with or caregiving for um, older adults in the community or being a caregiver within the community itself um, and how that might look different. And I'll also answer as many questions as I can. At this time, if you would like to unmute your mic, you may do so as well. Uh, otherwise, we can put in the chat box and you can share your experiences, share you know what you may be going through. If you have any specific questions, please definitely feel free to do so. So I do see something in the chat. Someone shared that they too have um, FTD from temple dementia themselves. Um, and just like Liz said, I do hope that, you know, you are able to find your own support network too with that. Uh, and that you are able to find the different resources that are available within your communities. Um, you know, just, in, just so that we are best prepared for the future whether that be with the legal financials and also the medical decisions, it's gonna be a need to make as well. Um, and of course, you know, both at Sage and also at Alzheimer's Association, we do have a lot of resources that can definitely help uh, navigate that for you. So thank you so much for sharing. Uh, question for you, Liz, uh, for the different statistics, I did see that there was like a little, um, attachments at the bottom, would that be made available to everyone who's on yeah. the? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a bunch of resources um, in that area that I can send out. Um, and I think that bringing up um, the legal aspect is um, also uh, incredibly important because we do have equal marriage at this point, um, and not every LGBTQ partnership um, looks like that. It, it's not always the same. So ensuring that your loved one has the same, um, has the access to your, um, your wishes, advanced directives, things like that, um, and the legal support around that is really important. Um, I do see another question in the chat. So as an ALZ employee, uh, we are only aware of a few LGBTQ plus caregiver support groups around the country. Uh, Liz, is the program you lead here in New York City, does SAGE lead other groups around the country that we can share either in person or virtual? Yes. Um, so the program that I lead is in New York City. Um, we have three ongoing support groups, one that is specifically for um, caregivers of folks with dementia and two that are general support groups, although all of those support groups also have caregivers of folks with dementia in them. Um, we also have our senior center programming, which includes a lot of, it, it includes meals, it includes daily um, activities and groups, um, both support groups and, and groups that are a little bit more casual. Um, things like bingo and, um, and arts and crafts and like really fantastic stuff. Um, and we do have some resources around the country. We largely have partner organizations around the country. So I have um, that are not funded by the same caregiving grant that we are because um, it is a New York state funding source. Um, and, um, and I think that um, there are, our most robust programs outside of New York City are in Florida. Um, so uh, I can also send around some resources about uh, national programming, but I know that our most significant and robust um, programming is here in New York City, where I am. 
So I did see someone rose their hand. If you want to unmute your mic, you may do so. Uh, hi, this is Sandra Calavera. Thank you, Liz, for your great presentation. I wanted to follow up on that previous question because as Director of Community Engaged Research for uh, here in New York City, uh, dealing with elders with HIV, we have a newly formed newsletter and we always try to put in resources. So we'd love to have that information of the support groups because we this is very new for us. We're in our second resource uh, newsletter rather. So it'd be great to increase. We also keep a very long list of resources so that when we do outreach to our research study participants, if they have any questions or need any assistance, we have a list you know, that we could use uh, for referral purposes. So that was one question. And I just wanted to add a, 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 an anecdote to follow up on your uh, statistics. Uh, I have a relative uh, that lives in Florida and uh, again, has a very large network of friends, but uh, last year, you know, collapsed in the bathroom and it happened, you know, early in the morning and, actually waited for over an hour before he called some of his friends for help because he didn't want to disturb them. And it was so early in the morning. So the issue of, yeah, support and, you know, the isolation and sometimes not wanting to bother, you know, because they're not necessarily relatives that live nearby and where there's no children is, is early is is a reality so just wanted to comment on that that i've actually seen that yeah i still i i would be happy again to send over the resources and, and have the, them included in that newsletter that's wonderful um but isolation also is a, a real reality we, we do talk a lot about chosen family and what the support networks are but the reality is a lot of folks are incredibly isolated um, and they don't necessarily have, you know, that person that they would call. Um, and so I referred earlier to, I have several clients whose neighbor is their their caregiver on paper. Um, and in some cases, that's just because they don't really have anyone else. And the neighbor was sort of amenable to um, to saying, yeah, you know, I can do this on paper, but they're not they're not really a caregiver in the in the sort of traditional sense that that we would um that we would sort of define it they're just someone who's willing to put their name on something and get annoying calls from me um in order to ensure that the person their neighbor is connected to care thank you liz uh while you're talking we actually got an influx of uh questions so here we go. Uh, here's our next question. Uh, well, first they said, Liz, great presentation, thank you. Um, do you have a brochure or materials we can put in our clinic that patients can take? Yes, we have palm cards. We just did our like pride flurry of printing palm cards. Um, so I will, um, if you want to reach out to me, I'm gonna put my email in chat right now um, and send a request and I can I can get some over to you. And then the next question we got, uh, with with the LGBTQ plus community, I find that there are many programs that are only directed more so for the heterosexual demographic. Does SAGE help with virtual programming like the activities that you said? Yes. Um, so a lot of our virtual programming um, is that we sort of implemented mostly during COVID is still going. Um, there's a lot of um, there are some roadblocks for the older adult community uh, with virtual programming. I know like a lot of folks um, have a hard time with Zoom and I have a hard time with Zoom sometimes. Um, but, um, you know, engagement with those is good. Um, and we do have um, both our in-person support groups and um, virtual support groups. Our major three caregiver support groups are currently running virtually right now, um, and we are in the process of making the in-person one happen, but there's um, there's definitely a lot of those resources. 
um, which again, I will send around um, with my sage information. Um, but it is, you know, something that a lot of folks in a lot of areas don't have access to. We're very, um, and I, I guess my my sort of bias is that I'm very New York City focused, but the reality is there are LGBTQ folks um, in much more rural areas that don't have the infrastructure that we do. Um, and, you know, having them having access to supportive care that is affirming and knowledgeable and understanding is vital. Thank you. And then um, a follow-up question actually was, um, speaking on Sandra's point, I feel like there are some points when speaking about sexual orientation uh, gets scary and we are afraid of being isolated. How can we find more institutions that are truly LGBTQ plus friendly and can meet the needs of those who are non-gender conforming? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that that's absolutely true. Um, it's something that we um, are sort of facing with a lot. We worry about um, our clients and where we're connecting them. We worry about sending, you know, home care agencies their way, like literally having individuals in their home um, and ensuring that they are protected and safe from discrimination um, emotionally and physically. And I think being able to vet agencies um, for LGBTQ competence um, is one of the major goals of the SAGE Care program, um, which is the, the training program that I mentioned earlier that will train agencies in LGBTQ plus competency. Um, it's not foolproof, I will say that. I think that like we, um, our programs have certain limitations um, and there are individuals who, you know, may still be discriminatory, uh, but it's also really important to understand how um, we can protect folks um, around that as well and how we can respond to those situations. Um, also be like having um, a care manager, um, someone who is affirming be um, a, a mediator um, and sort of be very upfront with um, with agencies and other staff, I found has been fairly helpful sometimes um, because, you know, a, a lot of us who work specifically in the LGBTQ space, um, we've, we've been there, we've seen it, we've done it, and we don't really take BS from other agencies um, that is discriminatory or, um, you know, even not as warm and welcoming as they should be. Um, so, you know, if there's if there's um, any ability to have an advocate, um, and it doesn't even have to be a formal advocate, it can be a friend, it can be a loved one, um, but having someone in place to sort of ensure that these conversations happen and that they go smoothly um, can be really helpful. Thank you so much, Liz. I think actually you might have touched upon these next two questions, which is what you just said. Uh, but we'll take it one at a time. So uh, <laughs> question is, um, are there any tips on engaging those in the LGBTQ plus community who may be hesitant to uh, participate with others for fear that they might be isolated? And how can one go about training for staff to know more about the LGBTQ plus competency? Yeah, um, even something as simple as having a, a pride flag sticker um, can be that little open door that some folks need. Um, being able to, you know, it's pride, it's June, like this is, this is the perfect time to implement like LGBTQ focused programming. Um, you know, if you're a senior center, maybe screen a movie that is LGBTQ plus focused um, or have a short-term support group to gauge some interest. Um, just having those conversations and being active and intentional in having those conversations and not expecting your constituents to speak up, um, to speak up themselves. You know, you you are the ones that should open that door. Um, and, and I think that's the responsibility of, of all agencies that are working with any sort of 
any population um, to be not just um, accepting, but openly affirming and consistently affirming. Um, and as as far as training for um, staff to know more about LGBTQ plus competency, Sage Cares does it, but there are also other agencies that do it. A lot of the times there will be local agencies that have trainings. I know there was um, one of the aging providers in New York City just had a trans 101 training. Um, and, you know, it's it's definitely something you keep an eye on, but it should 100%. If your staff is getting ongoing training, if they are getting continuing education at any level, LGBTQ plus competency should be a big part of that. Just like all other intersectional areas of competency. Absolutely. And I 100%, actually, I 200% agree with that, Liz. <laughs> Um, before we get into the next question, I, there was actually part two of that question. Um, I did see that someone actually posted in the chat box that in New York State, discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity slash gender expression is illegal. So both the person with dementia and the support family, friends have a right to advocate for respectful treatment. Absolutely. And I think that kind of goes... The reason why I read that was because the next question is, how can we advocate for someone who might be very anti-LGBTQ plus in the professional space, right? Uh, I think that kind of answers a little bit of the question, but we'll also bring back to you, Liz, for that. Um, so I want a little bit more uh, context on this question, actually, if that's all right. Um, because I, I feel like there are like two questions that maybe come up for me. And one is, um, if there is like a professional person that an LGBTQ client is encountering that is anti-LGBTQ, or if you come across a client who um, themselves is anti-LGBTQ. And both of those are situations that I have encountered. Um, we do have more so for the professional. Okay, got it. Um, so yeah, I, I like Desma mentioned, um, it's illegal to be discriminatory. Um, it's just, it's not advisable if you are a professional individual who's uh, working with um, any, you know, any sort of spectrum of clients to express discriminatory views. Um, and we hope that that is not happening, but we know that it is. Um, so there are a lot of ways that you can advocate for the client. Um, I think first and foremost, the client safety needs to be paramount. Um, and that may mean discontinuing work, transferring them to another professional, um, ensuring that, you know, that they are supported as much as possible within the agency. Um, and, you know, and I don't necessarily think it is about like immediately like discipline or, um, you know, or even like getting mad at this person. Um, I think it does go back to this training and stuff like that. Um, but if you are someone who is a caregiver for a um, for a person who's in the community and they are working with um, an agency and they experience some kind of discrimination, um, there are a lot of avenues. Um, First of all, I think it should be escalated. I think it should be escalated uh, to a supervisor. It should be escalated to, um, you know, as far up the chain as you can go because it is completely unacceptable. Um, and in a lot of places, it is illegal. Um, but also, there are other agencies that can come in and um, assist with advocacy for the client. Um, in New York City, we have the Anti-Violence Project um, that focuses specifically on discrimination um, in for LGBTQ plus individuals. Um, and there are a lot of ways that you can find an advocate who will be able to, in a sort of a professional way, interface with that agency and um, ensure that the issues are addressed. But again, like safety and comfort is first and foremost, um, especially if it's, you know, working with someone with dementia, um, any kind of, of um, cognitive impairment at all, um, ensuring that they are in a safe space in a safe situation and, um, you know, not having to interface with that as much as possible is paramount. Great, thank you. So, oh, 
I see actually two more things now. Um, today's participants, so beyond our local collaboration in New York City, so the Alzheimer's Association, we actually do have a national partnership with SAGE. So through that collaboration, we were actually very fortunate enough to work together on programs like today's webinar and a community forum that we actually did host in New York City in two weeks ago uh, with one of the New York City SAGE Senior Centers in Harlem. Um, so yes, we will, we also have access to training and resources for our staff. So thank you to Sage for all of your important work. Absolutely, let me give a heart for that one too. Uh, yes, and our second question is, thank you so much uh, from the same person, uh, also named Liz. Uh, um, thank you so much. Will we see Sage and Alzheimer's Association at New York City Pride events? Yes, yes, you will. Um, at least for speaking on Alzheimer's Association, we will actually be at Pride Fest. Um, let me see, the last Sunday of this month, which is the 30th, <laughs> 30th. And we will be at, I think, every oh. Pride in the boroughs. Um, I, I personally will be at Harlem Pride if you'd like to come say hi, um, because it's closest to my neighborhood. Um, but I know we will be in the main uh, Heritage of Pride Parade. We will have our big stage bus um, where we have a bunch of our constituents that ride on it. Um, I love the Sage bus. I'm a huge fan. Um, we will also be, we were at Brooklyn Pride this past weekend. Um, we'll be at Queens Pride, uh, Staten Island Pride, uh, pretty much every Pride. <laughs> you got Sagers. Harlem is the day before, it's the Saturday before um the Saturday before the like main uh, Heritage of Pride, I believe it's the 29th. Great. Oh, yes. Um, one of my colleagues just said, so we don't have the booth location yet, at least for uh, Pride Fest for Alzheimer's Association, but once it's signed, it will be posted on our website. Um, all these links will also be sent out after the email as well. Uh, let's see. I think that's it for questions, but let me do a quick countdown. <laughs> Anybody have any final questions for Liz? Oh, I see a raised hand. Elise? I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yeah, you got it. Okay. Um, my my question, but my experience is this: as a first of all, I'm in a lot of twelve step program support groups online, which just exploded with COVID, because we suddenly were using this resource. And the part of of South Carolina I live in, we just don't have any resources at all. I mean, I, I think we got a couple of stoplights in town, y'all. You know, but that's that's about it. Um, so. It, it it's as I say I'm I'm spoiled because on a national and international level we can get a lot of people together who really want an LGBTQ friendly support group type situation in that in that case for for alcohol or drug recovery or whatever recovery there's all just all in some of them they don't give they don't really care what you're recovering from they just find you're welcome here I it, for me it would be really nice to find on a national or international level online zoom groups where you could just meet with people who are working with you know my partner has dementia and um uh, and yeah it's it's incredibly stressful and um i don't I, you know there's no chance that there's going to be any kind of local support around here that's that's remotely like what you're seeing there um I've been to some of the groups that were, were specific to South Carolina and oh my gosh, the stare down, you know, I'm getting online and that is it's just, you know, just a little more than I care to deal with. Um, so, it's, and I've had the experience of trying to tap into a group that was out of the Northeast somewhere. I don't remember which state it was, but they turned down my application to enter into the group because they could only serve the people in their state, in their area. So is there any kind of a funding available or organization that's able to work something like that so that we can have online support availability for those of us who live out here in the middle of BFE that, um, you know, that we can tap into. There is 
you know, we have so many funding barriers and that is the most, I will say the most frustrating thing about working in social services is we are so limited by our funding to what we can do. Um, but it is something that I would really want to implement um, in almost a funding be damned way because I think there's so much um there, there's so much need and so much desire for it and and the fact is like our rural LGBTQ plus community is being neglected um and now we have this this sort of like beautiful um this beautiful infrastructure that is one of the sort of few silver linings that we received during COVID is this understanding that we can have these areas of community virtually um, and it is underutilized. Um, so thank you, Elise. I think that's a really good point. Um, and it's something that I want to bring up to Sage, but I'm also, I can also do some research on my own and see if there's anything that is, um, that would encompass um, a greater area of the country um but it's it's definitely something that I would want to advocate for in my role as well to implement that sorry for um, mute my mic uh, thank you Liz any other questions Going once, going twice. Okay, well, so uh, if you do have any further questions, uh, you can always email me as well. So um, I was the one who sent all the different reminders. So you probably do have my email, but I will also leave my email in the chat. I believe Liz also uh, put the email in the chat as well. But Liz, if you wanna just bump it up again, um, just that people do have it. That'd be great. Great. Yeah, I'm, I am happy to answer any questions anytime. If you think of anything, um, shoot me an email. Great. Uh, and then Liz, if you can send over your resources that you would like for me to send out in the email to all of our participants today, uh, we'll be doing that hopefully within this week. And once the recording is up on our YouTube channel, we will also send every, actually we'll send everything out at once uh, in one email. Um, and so be on the lookout for that. Um, other than that, thank you so much, everyone, for your time with today's program. Happy Pride Month. Happy Pride Month. And we will hopefully see you in our Pride Fest slash all of our different New York City Pride events. Um, and have a great rest of your day, everyone. And stay safe, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. At least if you want to like, oh, let me <laughs> stop recording also. <laughs> stop recording. And.